All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, um, thank you for allowing me to speak here. I'm feeling a little bit out of my depth. I'm not an academic. Um, and what I am bringing you today is quite a, a practical project. So I will distract you with lots of pictures, hopefully. Um, <laughs> but it feels very strange presenting something which almost feels so simple. And it might be a lot of things which you take for granted. But I think that's maybe the reason why I wanted to present. And it's part of it as well, is that um, you come from a very different context to what we're used to. Um, but hopefully you will enjoy a bit of what I have to say and um, yeah also very much looking forward to to some feedback um, so just to kick off I'll give you some context about our space um, there is a map of South Africa um, we are at the bottom of the African continent very far away from everything Johannesburg is kind of at the top in the middle there uh, it's the economic hub of the country. It's a very tiny province, but there's lots happening. Um, and that's our beautiful center. So um, it was founded in 2008, or the idea of having a Holocaust center in Johannesburg kind of began then. Um, we still had to build the building. It was officially opened, and the permanent exhibition was only opened in March 2019. So it's still very new. Um, and the last few years, especially with COVID, it's, it's kind of been a new, many new phases, um, but we're in a position where we, we can sort of develop the next things that we do. So we, we focus on genocide in the 20th century. Um, our main case studies are the Holocaust, but also the 1994 um, genocide against the Tutsi in Rwanda. Um, but we do also look at lots of themes that relate to it. So it's not just Holocaust, it's very much in the present, it's very much related to our space. So themes, human rights themes, uh, xenophobia is a very big one in South Africa at the moment, anti-Semitism, othering, racism, uh, we look at those and we're kind of figuring out our needs and that's essentially what this talk is about. So we, we do fall under the wing of the South African Holocaust and Genocide Foundation. There are two other centers which are based in Durban, which is on the East Coast, and then Cape Town, which is kind of the little bit on the West. Uh, Cape Town's about 20 years old, Durban's about 10 years old, so we, we're the babies in all of this. All right, so just to also give you an idea of how we use testimonies or what testimony we use, uh, we do have some survivors who still speak to schools. We have written and verbal testimonies uh, in our archive. And I've included library items because some of them have published their memoirs as well. We have live lecture recordings. So in 2019, we had an exhibition of portraits of Holocaust survivors. And part of the programming was that we would have someone giving a testimony. Uh, we had four testimonies then. We are using the dimensions in testimony as well, the hologram. Uh, we got that a few months ago. The kids are already into it. As you can see, someone said, I will never forget. Guess what? I spoke to a hologram. How cool. <laughs> so the kids really like that. Um, and then we, we obviously link to other archives and other collections, and we're learning a lot more about that. And then we have personal stories from staff and volunteers and descendants, and that's uh, something you'll see as well. It's something very special about our collection. Uh, and then a lot of what we have in the archive, they, they're personal collections. You know, they're people who bring things that belong to them, that belong to their family, and it sort of comes in a package. So I am going to speak about 2020 because it was pretty terrible for everyone but it was the best thing that happened to our archive. So we have a little pre and post 20, uh, COVID happening here. So on the right side, you can see Irene Klaas um, with a, a group of kids, a bit of a superstar. Below is our portraits event. Uh, all our survivors are there, large group opening for the exhibition. And then the other side, you can see where we kind of ended up, and this was already at the stage when we could have people back in the center, but uh, everyone's socially distanced, and Irene is giving her testimony via Zoom, uh, and in this case, she was actually in the building, so she's sitting upstairs in the office, and all the kids are downstairs, <coughs> and then she like give them a wave like the queen from the balcony, <laughs> like, hello, children. Uh, so 
we, we are kind of coming back to normal, but not quite. So 2020 was great for two main reasons. The first thing being that everything went digital. We were forced to create lots of audiovisual content. Um, we created webinars, podcasts, uh, but we also had lots of Zooms, and now we've got lots of recordings of that. The second thing is what we've, we've called the archive project, very imaginatively, which I'm going to speak a bit about now. Um, so, end of third quarter 2020, our funders came to us and said that they had an amount of money that wasn't spent by other partners because they couldn't run projects because of COVID, and they asked if we wanted it, and of course we said yes. Uh, but we found out about that at the end of September, and everything had to be spent by the end of December. And they were very excited about the, uh, the idea of an archive, but that put us in a very difficult position. Uh, but obviously we were like, we're gonna make it happen. So we got the money in our account in mid-October and within about three months we had to plan, create and sort of finish an archive. Um, so it really got us thinking about what, what was priority, what do we need to get started with immediately, uh, what do we need to spend the money on? That was the most important thing. If we didn't spend the money by the end of the year, uh, that was that. So went on a massive spending spree. Um, and then how can we get as much done as possible in this short time? And that was answered by our amazing, amazing students. So it's like, well, let's get as many hands on board as we can. Uh, put a call out to the University of Pretoria. They have just started the first masters in tangible object conservation in South Africa, which is huge, very exciting. These are their first graduates. So just said to them, do you have any students who may be interested? They were absolutely wonderful. They turned it into an internship because for the students as well, they hadn't done any practical work the, the whole year. So our academic year starts in February uh, and this is now November, December. So this was their first opportunity to work with items and they were very excited. Uh, but they, they were absolutely phenomenal, would hire any of them in a heartbeat, and it was such a wonderful process to work with them to develop this project and really kind of helped each other. That's another paper for another time. Uh, and then there's me getting very excited about our first lot of conservation items which have come through. So it's not really a huge amount, but in, we got 400 things done in about five weeks. We had an extra week, so at the end of it, we had 500 and something items, sorted, inventoried, cataloged, photographed, um, and we, we managed to train 11 young people. Most of them were these graduates. Um, some of them, Glenn, there, he has no experience he, uh, in archives at all. He worked on another project with me, but he's just a great guy, he's an excellent photographer. Um, yeah, and we built this really nice connection with the university, which is also wonderful. So very much hoping that we'll, we'll be able to do it later on. Uh, so after that, we had an updated internal catalog. And I say it's a start, we haven't finished this. It's still very much in the process of happening. But we, we managed to gather and relabel a lot of our digital files. They were just scattered all over with individuals. Uh, so at least now they're coming together in one place. We set up processes and systems and templates. Uh, we're kind of testing them now. So we're in the, the space where it's like, well, how do we alter them slightly? But so far they're quite good. Uh, then we have an online catalog. So we decided to use something called eHive, which I won't get into, but it's a, a free platform. And hopefully we will have it open and available to you all. You can, there is a link to it. There's just, it's mostly books at the moment, so it's not super interesting. We managed to get conservation grade supplies. We have fireproof cupboards. After seeing the archive yesterday, um, again, we, we do what we can. Good enough for us is very different to other spaces. We have two fireproof cupboards, and I'm very, very excited about that. Uh, we have a very small collection at the moment, so we, we're good for now. And then we, we tidied and reordered storerooms. So we found a space for our collection. It has our computer server in as well, which is terrible, but that's hopefully moving out. But essentially that was the best space to put everything. But yeah, we have our exhibition space. We have an archive storeroom now, all very cool. 
as far as the digital and the COVID, uh, COVID side goes, we have lots of online resources. I'm going to see if my links work, but if you go to our website, um, all these things we spoke about when it comes to the podcasts and all of that you can find online. Um, so that's really exciting. It helped a lot with education as well and with schools that they could access it. There you go. I'll speak a bit more about all these things. Um, there And then we also did a, a publication. So that also came out of the funding. Um, only about half of the funding was actually used on the archive. So we, we also did a digital publication. We have a hard copy, but also found online, Portraits of Survival. Volume one is about Holocaust survivors, uh, just stories, pictures about our local survivors. And then we did a volume two, which is about Rwandan survivors. Um, outcomes. So, as I mentioned, we've been able to use the testimonies for podcasting, social media, films, and publications, and they've also been adapted by the staff for what they do. So, you can see my colleague Catherine, she took, uh, this was our suitcase we were looking at earlier, she took it to a school, she a didn't take, suitcase? sorry, a real suitcase, it's a whole other story, yeah, yeah. so, um, yes, yeah, she took, it's the, the modern suitcase. Yeah. And then she didn't take the item. She took images of the items and she worked with that. Uh, and the kids have responded really well to having the items and the stories. And that works very well with the younger kids as well. So yeah, it's opened up access to our collections. A lot of people are referencing uh, within the organization and outside as well. And just having things in a space where we can find them, where it's structured, has been such a huge help. You know, if the education department asks about someone or something, we can actually go and look and we'll find the information a lot easier than we could before. Uh, so this is one example of um, our, the story of, we call it. This is the story of Oscar Lamsen, born in the city of Danzig in 1931 and deported with his mother to the island of Mauritius in December 1940. So the, the story of this is, is quite interesting. This was during the hard lockdown when kids couldn't go to school uh, and internet access is very different in South Africa to other parts of the world. People do not have Wi-Fi as easily. Uh, they use data and it's extremely expensive. So. There was a, a program run by one of our volunteers and they did storytelling, they worked with, um, with children and they couldn't do that anymore and so she asked if people could, could do little voice clips and send stories to the kids that they could get on WhatsApp because that's the easiest way to do it. So this was our contribution is that we did these, these little story ofs. Um, this is of Oscar Langsam from Mauritius and we learned a bit about Mauritius. Uh, this one's really nice because he, he actually this talks. This tragic story. Because Dad left to find the place of refuge for our family. He sent us a postcard with his temporary address because the ship he was on was stuck on the deck. Instructions for man kisses to the children the hesitant promise that we will meet again. So again, not going to do the whole thing, but you can find it on our website. Um, Oscar, he's really cool. He's still alive and he's, I think he's got his own YouTube channel. So we always see him. <laughs> like he, he's always on our, our webinars and he's always adding things. Um, but we, we did the short sort of five minutes or less stories um, about our survivors, which again are really nice snippets to use uh, in education. The other thing we did, Archive Friday, uh, if you follow us on Instagram, you'll see them. So we managed to catalog everything and then it's like, but how do will people know about this? Because we don't have a full catalog and we were very excited. So we, we do, kind of every second week, now it's every four weeks because we've partnered with Durban, so they, they do one and then we do one. Um, but we, we tell a little story based on a, an object that's in the archive. So this one is about this uh, Veronica. Friday, the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Centre would like to introduce you to a small doll with a homemade blue and white outfit. 
This beloved childhood toy belonged to Holocaust survivor Veronica Phillips, who received the doll in 1936 when she was 10 years old. She would take this doll everywhere until she was forced to leave it behind when the Nazis and their Hungarian collaborators deported her to Ravensburg concentration camp. Her father, Mayor Katz, who was also deported, was murdered. Remarkably, Veronica survived Ravensbrück, Penick, and Johann Georgenstadt concentration camps, as well as a death march. Veronica's mother, Regina, and brother Michael survived the Holocaust in the international ghetto in Budapest, Hungary, and after the war, Veronica was reunited with them and the doll. Her mother had kept it safe for her in the ghetto. Veronica was an avid supporter of the JHGC and played a vital role in Holocaust education up until her death in February 2021. The doll is on display in the JHGC permanent exhibition where we will remember Veronica and acknowledge the important role she played in sharing her testimony. All right, so um, those are our Archive Fridays and it's been really nice personally to research the objects a little bit and to kind of bring these things together. Um, these are all survivor stories. So we have Irene Klaas, who you saw before as well. The violin uh, is about Cecilia Borachowicz, um, but follow us on Instagram and you'll get one every second week or so. Um, and then we, we've also started doing little exhibitions related to the archive, which is also great. So. Very simple, this is one for um, Ellen Sief. Uh, she was a child in hiding and one of the ladies who looked after her, uh, Madame Barbara Sheff, is a righteous among the nations. So she, she donated uh, various items to us and that's what's happening at the top there. And then we, we did a small exhibition and the amazing thing is that Ellen comes to see it. And as she's looking at it, she explains other things and that's quite a unique place to be in. Uh, also, the, the other two items, which is something very cool which happened as well, they're from another donation. And as I was looking at these various things, recognized the names, and I was like, oh, but Ellen has a cousin, Nathan, and this is her cousin, Nathan, Nathan Morland. Uh, so someone else brought these items in, and we now have this sort of extended collection of items. And yeah, also, and then she says she, knows, like she remembers them and she knows them and they also live in South Africa. So then got her to read through, Top Right is a, a school project that Nathan's daughter did. She wrote a little biography and, and then read through it and she kind of was like, yes, all true and this and I remember this person. So we're sort of collecting all these things as we go along as well. Um, yeah, and then there were all these really really not as expected outcomes. So since we've been doing this, we've been getting a lot more donations, which is so wonderful. So people realize that there is a space for these things. Uh, they, they realize that people are interested and they're starting to bring us items uh, and testimonies as well. Just before I, I came here, we, we recorded someone, we got a donation of things. Uh, there's definitely an increased appreciation of the archive and there's, again, it's very misunderstood what happens in these spaces. There's no understanding of, of how you are supposed to look after items, what goes behind it. And, and so this is giving people an idea of the things you see in the exhibition, why we have them, what's involved, how complicated it is. Uh, even with the staff in our center, they're getting a new kind of idea about it. And so a lot of our volunteers are, are getting very excited about it as well. We, we've trained a bunch of people. I've set up uh, like an archiving and a conservation 101 to train people very quickly on how to handle items and what to look for. And um, we, having the students was amazing, but that, that was sort of, we don't know when they're coming back. So generally the people involved have absolutely no experience working in museums and handling items. Uh, but they bring a lot of personal knowledge and a lot of them are descendants as well, which is really cool. So with that as well, I'm now encouraging our volunteers to, to archive their own family histories, which is bringing in a whole other dimension and they finally going through their family stories. 
uh, and hopefully adding it to our collection at some point. Yeah, and there are all our, our lovely volunteers pre-COVID. So, as I said, once we were going through this and reflecting on it, realized that we, we already have this living archive, which is such a wonderful thing. And the survivors, these are all survivors here. They, they're part of our family, they're our friends. A lot of the survivors, I, I met them and then I found out about their stories, which was crazy. But um, we have Doris on the left with her son, uh, looking at her section in the permanent exhibition. Um, there's Lionel in the middle as well. He came to the center one day and, and was just chatting to him. And then he was like, come, I'll show you this and sort of started explaining things to me. We had a temporary exhibition about the Woj Ghetto, I'm saying that right. Um, and Irene was there. So there's uh, Tali, our director, with Irene looking at the map and she was explaining certain things. Um, yeah, and then at the bottom, that's uh, Sally Peril came a little while ago, and we have a survivor group. Unfortunately, they haven't been able to meet for a very long time, but I think this month they're having their first meeting in ages, so it's just they get all together. They don't talk about the Holocaust. They're not interested in that at all. They sing songs or they talk about their grandchildren, um, but they, they get together and have a little social yeah, so next steps, I mean, there's, there's been a lot happening and I think kind of trying to do this presentation as well was a real challenge because I didn't, just trying to make it coherent in some way and hopefully I did. There's so many aspects to it, so it was just to give you a little taster. But um, again, it's really interesting developing an archive and trying to figure out how, how we do this, what do we need? So to be in the position to kind of say what is in our collection, um, what testimonies do we have and what do we still need to collect? And we do still have some survivors who are alive and we can actually approach them if we have any questions about things and hopefully get some answers. Um, but also the need for, for stories from our continent and there's a very definite gap and I think sitting here being part of various webinars you know you all you need to research something there are hundreds of archives and collections you can go to we need to research something we have to create an archive so um and as we're doing this there are lots of stories which are out there which have not been collected um which are really really interesting and obviously linked to the continent as well so we're trying to gather that um, I'm very much hoping to make it a space for Holocaust in Africa, so we can start focusing on that. Uh, and then beyond the Holocaust as well, it's, you know, we have a center in our space to speak to various other themes, to speak to the future as well, to kind of educate people on various themes. And a lot of those themes, said xenophobia, refugees, all of that, they're very relevant now. So we have uh, added Mr. John Boisset at the top there, who's a, a great friend of the center, who is a refugee from Congo. He's a, an educator. He um, does a lot of advocacy in the community. And we, we're trying to gather a few stories like that as well without getting too far from what we do. Um, and then we're just developing the process. So we are continuing cataloging, packing. We'll get the e-hive up eventually. Um, it's there, it's just hopefully we can move on it. And we continue to support our community and I think that's also, you know, why are we doing this? And a big part is the memory and it's the memory of our survivors um, and their descendants as well. And we do have a lovely community in South Africa. So we, we're just trying to, I don't know, trying to do our best, but we, we're trying to do what we can for our community and build a real community. Um, yeah, and then again, when we look at, you know, with our archive, and maybe people can assist with these, but how do we build a full picture of an individual's life? And practically speaking as well, if we have a collection, what needs to be in that collection? Um, what should we include? And we're trying to piece together all these little bits of things. How do we build a living archive that's dynamic and relevant? And hopefully we've, we've made good first steps in that, but how do we continue to do that? How do we make sure that it gets used, that people add to it? 
And how do we bring the stories of the past into the future? And what does that mean for our collection? So I don't work in the education department, actually. Um, but it's, it's really wonderful to see people using the archive, to see the kids interacting with the survivors. They get so excited about it. Um, and, and yeah, how do we build on that? How do we keep people excited uh, and going forward as well? And that's the end. Thank you very much.